so I cannot hear you, so if you can write in the chat. Can you write just yes or okay in the chat if you are hearing me? <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks. Okay, so um, welcome back uh, to this final lecture, uh, practical implementation of quantum computing. Um, today, we want to introduce the concept of quantum noise, quantum noise in quantum computing, and one way to face this problem we have in all our laboratories today, which is the error mitigation. So uh, the first part of the lecture will be more theoretical maybe, but I would like you to focus on the concepts of this, and if you have questions, stop me, just uh, in case we can discuss, okay? So uh, I will start by listing some possible motivations of the noise. So not motivations, so uh, some possible um, sources of noise we can have in our laboratory. So in this, uh, in this picture here, you see that one very important thing we need to take into account is the decoherence, the yellow box, which is the fact that we are not able to preserve the quantum state for a long time. The system is not perfectly isolated, so after a while, some quantum properties like the, we could call the off-diagonal elements of our state, the quantum part of the states, are um, vanishes. Then we have the thermal noise. If you have some technology which, which is uh, based on some specific implementation in terms of temperature, for example, superconducting qubits, if you are superconducting loops and you need to keep the system around millikelvins, then it can happen that for some reason, interaction with the environment or maybe because you are running and the cables are some way eating, then you can lose the properties. And again, you can have problems related to this. No, can, can they can be causes of one, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, okay. yes. I'm trying to give uh, names of this, but yeah, decoherence is more the picture. More yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. This is, we can say the decoherence is the problem in exactly. some way, yes. Um, and this can be, I mean, some way causes of the decoherence, not only, because we can also have some different kind of problems, like control errors. So you are not perfectly able to control your device or maybe you are not perfectly able to uh, register the output in a correct way. So you can have problems in maybe you just register one zero like it is a one or one one like it is a zero, okay? Problems like this. Another possibility of no noise source could be the quantum state leakage, which is the fact that typically when you build some uh, quantum device, it can happen that your technology by nature is not a two level system. But in general, it's a more than two-level system. I was talking with um, someone of you before who is working with qubits in his work. So in that, in that scenario, quantum computing is searching for more than two levels of energy. But in this, kind of in this kind of setup, in which we want zero and one, maybe you are not perfectly able to isolate the ground state and the first excited state. And sometimes it happens that you access also the second excited state. And this can be a problem because I mean, yes, it's a problem in this mm, picture. And then can be the cross-talk problem. And so the fact that maybe you want to apply some specific operation to one qubit of your device, but it can happen that uh, for some reason, due to the construction of the device, the mm, pulses, for example, you send to a qubit, some way they affect the neighbors. Or a, and this can be a problem because you want something very isolated to that qubit, but it can happen that the qubits are talking each other during the execution, okay? And all together, these things, mostly under the space of the decoherence, like Dairo was pointing out, uh, they can create problems when you execute your quantum circuit. For now, we just simulated exactly or with shock noise, so a number of shocks defined. But in practice, all these problems in the lab are real. And so you need to take into account this problem. I want to ask you a question before uh, running to the noise definition. And it's, uh, what about the shot noise? Because also the shot noise is a problem. Because you cannot execute the system infinite amount of time. And ideally, 
you should execute it infinite an infinite amount of, of time if you want to be closer to the exact simulation. But in the lab, every execution takes time, and so you need to decide how many times you want to execute the circuit. And so I wanted just to ask you, I mean, is this a real problem in the lab? In your opinion, how to solve it? And what's the difference between this noise and the other noises? Some idea? So I mean, you can run far analysis on specimens, mm -hmm. but it's really inefficient. Which one? No, uh, the discussion one is more efficient. You mean you have more executions in less time? Sorry? You have more executions, so more results in the same time. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, which is basically the, the answer. No, we just need to do it more times, because the only way to, to fix uh, statistical uncertainties is to in, in improve the statistics, so do more and more and more and more executions. The other are typically more systematic problems, so uh, you have, yes? So I, I think I'm in the interior level, the lower level of the universe. Uh. But uh, I think that there's a strong noise uh, uh, that I think very long hours. Yep, indeed. So uh, this, then you should have time of execution, you can just do more simulation than- Exactly, this is the, the point. Systematic. Systematic. Yes. <laughs> it's actually what you yeah, what you are saying. In case oh sorry, I have telegram. Uh, let me close the agenda. Okay. Close the door. Okay. In case you have uh, a statistical error, the ideal situation is just to perform the experiment many, many times. And the precision scales with the number of experiments. If it's systematic, no, uh, the problem is it's systematic, so you need to face it in some different way. Thanks. So, uh, let me introduce a bit the notation. Uh, if we stay in the picture of the exact simulation, so we don't have noise, we don't have problem, typically is enough to speak about vectors in the Hilbert space and unitary operators. This is what we did the last days. So, what happens is that you have your state, psi, you apply some unitary u, and then you get your final state, psi prime. And typically, if a state can be represented like a vector in the Hilbert space, we can ref refer to this state as pure state. What about pure states? You can stay in this picture of pure states and so play with the linear algebra with just vectors and matrices until the system is, is isolated. In the moment in which the system is no more isolated, then we have problems, and the states are no more um, a reliable mathematical tool to describe the state. It's not, it's not enough. And typically, we need to refer some to some different tool that I will introduce in the next slide. Hmm? In this picture, we are getting back to the block sphere, which is one way to represent uh, one qubit. And in this kind of picture, one state, so, pure state, is a point on the surface of the block sphere. And typically what you do by playing on the state of a qubit is applying unitary operators like Q and moving a point of the block sphere on the surface to another point of the surface. And the nice uh, property of this kind of operation in this picture is that typically these kind of operations are reversible. So it's easy, you apply the inverse of U and you get back to the original point, okay? If we complicate the things, like in typically in the real life happen, then the state is no more a mathematical tool which is reliable. We need to use what we call uh, density matrices, or um, another way we also can call mixed states. So a pure state is a pure state, just a vector in the Hilbert space. A mixed state is a classical mixture of pure states. And can happen that, mm, indeed, uh, many different pure states, combine them together with some probability of occurring, uh, combining, I mean, combining them together in which we can call indeed a density matrix, a mixed state. The definition of the density matrix typically is the one you see there, in which psi is a pure state, and pi is the probability of getting that pure state in the mixture of the pure states, okay? Typically we call it rho, the density matrix. In the context, in the same picture of the block sphere, it's nice to see it, in my opinion, uh, a pure state is a point on the surface of the sphere, 
a mixed state is a point inside, can also be a point on the surface is if it's also a pure state. A uh, remarkable case of mixed state, a pure state. But in general, it's a point inside the sphere. And typically this, let me say, uh, heuristic jumping from the surface to the inner part of the sphere is due to the interaction with the environment or some kind of uh, interaction with something else. Okay, so it's, not, it's no more an isolated system. And then we have some different notations to describe this kind of thing. The operators become super operators. It's just a way to call them and uh, or channels. And typically in quantum computing, we call them channels because we speak about noise channel. You will see in a, in a slide. But yeah, this is just a notation, okay? And um, yeah, nothing more. Mixed state density matrices. Someone of you yesterday asked about the simulation in density matrix notation. Where, where, where? Ah, yes, 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 thanks. Yes, or my N minus Z, you're right, you're right, thanks. Um, I'll, I will remind me later. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine, thanks. Um, okay, so a uh, little bit, I want just to show you a very simple example of difference between the pure states and the mixed states because it was the one I got it the most when I tried to understand the difference uh, some time ago. And it was okay, but let's take into account the most simple scenario in which I have the maximally entangled state. Sorry, another typo. Uh, maximally superposed state. This is uh, one over uh, square root of two, zero plus one. This is a pure state. It's a vector in the Hilbert space, but is, uh, it already has, a it also has a density matrix, the one you can see there. One half, one half, one half, one half. And on the block sphere, you can represent it like the point corresponding to the, uh, indeed, the point in which the sphere cross the x-axis. Okay. If we take, on the other hand, the classical mixture of zero and one, this is a mixed state, no more a pure state. It can be defined like the, um, like as you see in the second line, so the sum of the, uh, yeah, sorry, just some zero, zero, one, one. And if you compute the operation, you will see the matrix is different. And in particular, I want you to focus on the fact that the off-diagonal elements are vanishing. We can say that the off-diagonal elements are um, what make the state more quantum in some sense, okay, more egoistically speaking, okay? No, in this case, in this case, no. In this case, no. Maybe there is no way. In this case, no. In fact, there was a, a, once I was playing with the qubit we have in the lab, I was super happy because I was applying an Adamard gate and I got 0 0.5 of probability for zero and one. Then I looked at the clusters distribution uh -huh. and there was the same distribution. So it was 0 0.5 because the, it was just no, no distinction between this, the two clusters. Cluster typically in the lab are the zeros, classified as zeros and ones. Was, yes, indeed, this is quite interesting because these two states are very different. One is pure quantum, another one is um, the maximally mixed state, so it loses all it, its uh, quantum properties, but in the end, if you check, it's impossible to detect them. Yeah. If you think about the measurement, can you do this with uh, I think no. Yes, of course. If you have a plate and measure you can. the plus direction, then you Ah, yes, yes, indeed. Then you will see that one you should be always plus, plus, plus. You should expect, yes, yes, you are right. You should expect always one and always good point. Yes, thanks. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So let me now exploit this uh, notation of the super operators and density matrices to introduce what we call the noise channel, which is indeed an operator or super operator which ty typically we use to describe the noise. Now, I'm going to introduce a very simple noise channel, which is not 100% representative of what happens for real in the lab, like all the sources of noise we were mentioning before. It is just a way to describe some, a, a very dummy way to contaminate the state, okay? In this case, we are taking into account um, an initial state row, we can say, and to this state row, we apply some modifications randomly. 
The picture, and this is the reason for which we call this state uh, Pauli noise channel, in this case is a local Pauli noise channel, which means we are applying at the level of the single qubits, is just to uh, exploit the formalism of the Paulis, x, y, y, and z, to apply some modifications on the state which are, which are discrete and uh, we can know physically what is going on. For example, if you apply, apply an x gate, you know you are swapping ones into zeros and vice versa. And so if you randomly apply a bit flip like this, you, you could understand we are modifying the state uh, randomly. We are losing the original shape of the state. The z can be exploited to do some phase flip. So in case you have a one, you get the minus one. And the y is a combination of the x and the z. It's a mm, slightly more complicated way to contaminate the state. And in, the, in general, you can define this uh, channel, the n channel, applied to the row matrix, uh, which is, uh, in part, the red part, leaving the state untouched, unchanged. And in, uh, in the, uh, the second part, you are applying the Paulis to the state randomly according, accordingly to the probabilities pk we define. A more generalized model could be the one in which you don't use the Paulis, you use Pauli strings. So you go and you affect the qubits together or maybe blocks of the qubits or more flexible noise channel. But to, this, I mean, to show you a possible way to define the model, uh, the, the noise model, uh, I just wanted to mention this dummy but remarkable case. What can happen if you contaminate the state on this way, the red box? So the point is that models like this, in general noise channels also, tend to mm, push, to change your quantum state as close as possible to the maximally mixed state. So we come back to the original definition, you remember? Which is defined like you see here. So it's just a um, multiple of the identity. The, all the off-diagonal elements are getting uh, vanishing with the time. You are losing the quantum property. And one remarkable uh, property of this kind of uh, density matrix here is that if you compute expectation values, specific expectation values, and in quantum computing, these kind of expectation values are very widely used. In particular, expectation value of Paulis, observable, so x, y, z, or combinations, p, then you get zero. So you tend to have expectation value equal to zero, okay? So the noise, in some sense, is like uh, restricting the possible, the possible output you get computing the expectation value of some observable. In this specific case, you get zero. The, the higher is the noise. And the proof is there in the formula if you want, just uh, following the fact that it's the multiplication between the Pauli and the identity and, uh, <coughs> and so on. Okay. So reality is more complex than this. We are going to implement the Paulinus channel, local Paulinus channel, but uh, for the sake of, I mean, to be honest with you, I would mention some problems of this model here. Uh, first of all, in this model, we are acting on single qubits. So we are applying Paulis, a flip, a phase flip, a Y operation on a qubit one per time, if you want, to each qubit of the system after each gate. But in general, we are applying um, operations to single qubits. This is not general. Uh, in a system, as we were mentioning before, you can have uh, noise which affects um, multi qubits in the same time. Okay, so uh, can be correlated across multiple qubits. Again, we are assuming the noise is acting in a way we can call uh, Markovian. Okay, so we assume. The noise we are applying at some specific time of the execution is not depending on the, sta on the state we had the time before, okay? A bit, a bit before in the time. And this is in general not, not true. So it can happen that in many quantum systems exhibit non-Markovian dynamics in the sense that what happens at some specific point is strongly related to what you had a second before, okay? Second uh, metaphorically. And then, the fact that, as I was mentioning, Pauli errors uh, act on the system in a discrete way. So we are bit flipping, phase flipping, are just discrete operations, but in general, this is not true. You can have uh, continuous error, depending on some parameters of the lab or something like this, okay? And just to give you an example of the complexity of the problem and how we try to tackle it in Kibo, 
These are the noise channels we have implemented in Kibo. Among them, you find the Pauli noise channel, which in general uh, is not uh, built on Pauli's, but Pauli strings, so it can be also global noise channel. But also, you have a lot of different <coughs> models. So a general unitary channel in which you can define your unitary operators. Same formula before, but general unitaries. Depolarizing channel in which basically randomly you uh, substitute part of this, you replace part of the state with the maximally mixed state directly. Um, a reset channel, which is try to emulate what happens when you reset the problem. So in the lab, you often need to come back to the ground state because you execute your circuit and then you want to execute it again. So you want to come back to the ground state. But sometimes it can happen that you are not able to perfectly come back to the ground state. Or again, we have the readout error channel. So uh, problems in the readout. You take your result and you have some problems, some <coughs> bit flip maybe also there. And then we have these three here, which are, I would say, uh, linked among them together. The phase damping channel um, tends to represent the probabilistic loss of quantum coherence of the system. We were mentioning it before. While the amplitude damping channel try to represent the probabilistic error, uh, loss of energy of the system, just for the sake of mentioning it. The thermal relaxation channel is uh, representing both of these losses together, combined. Okay? So now we introduce the noise with the notation of the noise. And the question is, okay, but we should try to do something to mitigate or to, to correct these errors in the lab. And the way you can follow are two. The red one was already mentioned during these lectures is the quantum error correction. I'm not an expert of quantum error correction, but in general, I what I can say to you is that error correction routines and algorithms are very powerful because what you do, typically also exploiting ancillas, like we were mentioning yesterday, we were mentioning yesterday is to create a um, sort of mechanism for which you are able to isolate and protect some specific qubit of your system, which then can be used as logical qubits, free of error. Okay? For, for doing this, typically you need many, many qubits more. We speak about order of magnitude of qubits more to protect a few qubits right now. Because right now we also have the problem that each qubit, the single qubit is, uh, has a quite uh, big amount of noise itself. So the point is, is perfect because we completely remove the noise. Uh, is not enough feasible because we need a huge amount of qubits. We speak about hundreds of thousands of qubits, a lot of qubits. Okay. The second approach is, we can say, um, less perfect in the sense that we are not correcting 100% the qubits. We are not going to have logical qubits, but thanks to some post-processing post -processing actions, on algorithms, we are using what we know about the noise to mitigate the effect of the noise. So the idea is I exploit what I know about the noise, like studying how the noise is acting on my system, and then I try to get an expectation value, we were speaking about expectation values before, uh, in which the amount of noise is less, and I'm getting closer to the correct solution. We know 100% that we are not going to correct the solution, so we are not getting the correct solution. And here, since we cannot um, describe all these things, because in my case, I, I don't know a lot about error correction, and also we, had, we have no time to go inside the quantum error mitigation, I leave you some references that can be um, very interesting, in my opinion, in our opinion, to study the topic if you like, okay? If you click, these are links, uh, you get rendered to the archive number or the, the paper. Okay. So before closing this uh, theoretical part, let me introduce you one way to perform quantum error mitigation. The same we are going to implement later, okay? Uh, which is called Clifford data regression. Again, I will introduce some concepts uh, very, very fastly. I will leave you some reference if you want to navigate in, uh, in this kind of topics. But the idea, as I was mentioning, is that with quantum error mitigation, what we want to do is to exploit our knowledge about the noise in order to mitigate the effect of the noise. We don't pretend to remove the noise, we just mitigate it. So let me take this scenario, okay? We have um, quantum circuit, CO, C0, 
which is our uh, target unitary operator we want to execute in our laboratory, uh, which we apply to the state row. And then we want to compute some expectation value, let me call it uh, O0, bracket with O0, uh, which is the expectation value of some observable O over the state we get if we execute C0 on the initial state row. Okay. So we have our circuit, we execute it, we get the final state, and we use the final state to compute some expectation value. This O0 is the theoretical value, the exact value. What we want to know. But the system is noisy, so you execute your problem in the lab, and what you get is the O0 noisy, which is not O0. Now, the Clifford data regression follows this pipeline here. We define this diagram in which we have our noisy expectation value. And the goal is to find the mitigated expectation value in the red box. So what you do is, is the following. We have our circuit, target circuit C0. We know the circuit, so we know how many gates, how is, I mean, which is the depth of the circuit, the architecture in general. And if we assume that the noise is related to the gates, same hypothesis we did before, not generally va uh, valid, Okay, most, most of the times can be, but in general can also be different to this. We say, okay, I'll, now I can generate a set of circuits, like let's say M circuit, 100 circuits, which has the same number of gates and the same architecture of my target, but they are slightly different to my target. So we replace some of the gates randomly with some gates we call Clifford gates. Clifford gates, which are unitary operators, which are part of the Clifford group, if you are interested. If you want to know why Clifford gates are important here, I suggest you to look at this reference in the footnotes. But in general, the important point here is that Clifford gates allow you to simulate fastly. So if you want to simulate your quantum circuit, you can simulate uh, fastly, okay? And this is important because now you will see. We have our target quantum circuit C0. We generated a set of circuits which are composed of Cliffords and non-Clifford gates, depend on how ma many gates you replace, randomly. All these circuits will be representative, more or less, of the same noise of the initial circuit, because they are of the same dimension, okay? So what you do is to compute the expectation value for all these circuits, both exactly simulating and with noise on the device or simulating with noise. So you get these two big set of results. The, ex the, noisy sim the noisy results on the x axis, the exact results on the y axis. You plot these points, expectation value noisy versus expectation value exact. You get a cluster of points. And typically because of this kind of setup, you will see this expectation value will be distributed uh, along a line, but it can also be a more difficult distribution if you want. The game at this stage is that you have a distribution of points, and this is representative of the noise. So what you do is to fit, for example, in this case with a line, a black line, and now you have a map. If you have a line, any new point, you can map through the line, and if it's noisy in the input, you get the noiseless, I would say the mitigated in output. So the game is, I have the target C0, I generate a set of uh, Clifford data regression circuits, like I was mentioning. You plot the results, you fit them, and then you take again C0, you compute the expectation value noisy, and you map it into the mitigated. Is it clear? Okay. Yeah. No, it's not general, I mean, it's not general. I mean, the Clifford data regression is more uh, flexible than other techniques because you are um, replacing only part of the circuit with the Cliffords. If you, like in other techniques, like other techniques we use, replace, for example, with all Cliffords, then you are changing the set of gates, you are changing the subspace of the Hilbert space you are exploring, and then you are not sure you are representing the noise. In this case, yes, but under some constraints, like the fact that the noise is, represent, uh, is affecting the gates, for example. And in, this in general can be not true in some scenarios. Sorry? 
for example, yes. Uh, regarding this, I'm not sure if Clifford data regression uh, is effective or not. More about the global and the locality of the problem. Um, oh yeah, maybe we can discuss later about this. Uh, yes, but it's it's important to say that this is this is not covering all the possibilities also. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the point is that you have your circuit, which is typically in this setup here is a parametric circuit, like composed of a lot of rotations, a lot of gates. And if you do it well, you typically have something that's able to represent the whole Hilbert space. V of, of course, you should sample uh, the parameters in a uniform way, according to the what we call the Haar distribution, but in general is there uniform distribution for this kind of spaces. And so you know that your circuit, in principle, is an object which lives in that space. With this kind of technique, uh, as done, the, as done the, assumption, the assumption I was mentioning before, by varying only part of the gates randomly and taking uh, enough, rep enough circuits in the training set, then you should be quite sure you are quite well representing this space. In the case you replace all the gates with Clifford gates, then you are changing the rules of the game because you are r r changing the, the set of gates in this. I don't know if I answered. Uh, so yeah, Clifford gates make the simulation faster. If it's pure Clifford, super fast. If it's hybrid, you have some, adva you have some advantage, but. Uh, See, the important point of simulate fast is that uh, you need simulation because you need to map noisy versus exact. So you need to do the exact simulation in this approach. Okay? There are many different techniques also. One very famous technique is called zero noise extrapolation. Maybe you know it, maybe you heard about it. In this case, you are taking the same circuit and you are applying different gates, different amount of gates around you know they are not changing the expectation value in theory, but then you are, s basically you are increasing the number of gates, so increasing the, the noise, but you expect the same expectation value. What you see is that the expectation value deteriorates, and what you do is to map, okay, level one of noise, level two of noise, which is double of the level one, see uh, again, and then you interpolate, and you do zero noise extrapolation, so you check, same, the um, interpolation with the zero. There are many techniques. These are post-processing techniques, but you can navigate. We have, uh, I think you have enough material here to, in particular, the first one is a review, quantum error mitigation. It's full of techniques about quantum error mitigation. Okay, so I think this is enough for the theoretical introduction. <coughs> if you have uh, any other question. Just a second, we should. So now we have two tutorials. The first tutorial is to simulate quantum noise. So following what Matteo presented, the goal is to have something that can be applied to our simulations. So then we can see the results using the exact simulation, the exact state vector simulation, and generate customizable error noise. And then there will be a second tutorial where we try to mitigate the noise, okay? So in this first lecture, the lecture six, the goal is really to s use the basics that we saw before with circuit composition, but now create a noise model. So let's go down and start our implementation as usual by installing Kibo, installing Kibo JIT and uh, the Kibo Edu. So this is the, the standard approach. 
and then jumping directly into the imports. So here we import NumPy as NP, then matplotlib, as PLT. Afterwards, we go ahead with Kibo, so import Kibo. From Kibo, we import the circuit object, the gates, and also in this case, the Hamiltonians. And finally, we import the Kibo Ebu script, so from Kibo Edu dot scripts import the plot script. Mm -hmm. Okay, no? Yeah. Good. Can you, can you see the You can read it, right? Yes. Okay. Good. So then next step is eventually, if you, if you want, we can double check what is the Kibo backend. So in my case, I do Kibo get the backend just to make sure that I know what is the engine. So in this case, I'm simulating with Kibo JIT and Numba on the CPU zero, which is my CPU. Okay. So let's move on now. In order to apply a noise, uh, we have to define a circuit for sure. No? So in this context, let's try to have a circuit based on three qubits and for example, uh, three layers of rotations and control knots. So let's do something that a little bit more complicated than, uh, than before. And we could also have the simulation based on density matrix uh, because this would be great in order to, for example, uh, make a plot of the density matrix after the exact simulation and the simulation with noise. Because if we do things properly, you should see that the density matrix will fall, ba fall back to the diagonal case when we have noise. No? So let's go here and start typing the number of qubits. So n qubits equal to three and the number of layers also equal to three. Then we can activate the density matrix uh, for the simulation by doing C equals circuit. We set the number of qubits and then the density matrix equal three. Yeah, let's make go, I'll jump a little bit up because may, the people in Zoom are asking. So here we go, you have the imports okay now let's continue we have our circuit with uh, three qubits and density matrix true now what we can do is that we loop over the layers so for l in uh, range and layers we can now we can now do another four loops of so for qubit in range and qubits and for each qubit we apply a series of gates so in particular i you do in this example uh, gates dot um, rotation over y for all qubits by setting q equal to q and the theta equal to zero Then I include another gate, another rotation, now over Z for each qubit Q with theta equal zero. So this will bring us all the rotations for all qubits, so we have all the operations that are done simultaneously. And finally, um, we can attach to this first part of the circuit, some control knots. So here again, I you create another for loop over qubits. 
and I do C dot add gates dot C not using the control qubit Q and the target equivalent to Q plus one. Now, I don't want to do zero to from zero to n qubits because otherwise it would be impossible. So here I do range from zero to n qubits minus one with steps of one. Okay, so I'm putting just a last control knot that is connecting each qubit to, to the next one. Good. Last thing to do is to apply attach some measurement gates. So I do c.add gates.m and I perform measurements over all qubits. So star range and qubits. Next step, let's have just a plot and see how this circuit looks like. So I do print C dot draw. And here you go, here we have the circuit. As, a, as expected, we have the three qubits. Each qubit has control Y's and control Z's, and then, uh, sorry, rotations over Y, rotations of Z, and then a control that interconnects uh, the pair of qubits. And this is repeated three times because we have the three layers. So one layer will be identified by the first block until reaching the next rotation over Y. Great. Okay, so this is now our, our circuit. Um, we can print, for example, the summary also here to check out how many gates are there. And we see there is a depth of 13, total number of gates 25. And the next we can compute the number of parameters. No? So if you know that there are nine rotations over Y and nine rotations over Z, we should expect to see 18 uh, parameters. So we can go upstairs here and try to do this computation by setting M params equal to the length of C get params this way and then we can print the number of parameters Yeah, be careful with the indexes. So I'm doing range from zero to n qubits minus one with steps of one. Okay. Right, so you, as you can see here, from the summary, we had uh, nine rotations of Y, nine rotations over Z. So the total number of parameters is 18 as expected. No? Very good. So now what we can, can we do? We, let's try to randomize the angles, these 18 parameters. So what we do is that I take some uh, linear spaced uh, function from NumPy and create angles from zero to two pi. And then I try to insert uh, those angles into the circuit. So to do that, uh, I can create a variable called angles and do what exactly what I said. So numpy will be np dot lean space, so linear space at points from zero to two pi. And then the total number of parameters that I have to generate will be n params.
Okay, good. Great, we have, a we have 18 parameters. Now, the mechanism to load those parameters into the original circuit is very, very simple. We have a, a special method from the circuit class, which is C dot uh, um, set parameters. And this function takes as an input, I mean, you, can, uh, you can have a look, you know, if you do, if you do circuit dot set parameters and a question mark, I mean, this is a basic Python feature. Then you have uh, the signature. The signature is just taking parameters as an input, and parameter is a, con is a container for new parameters. It can be a list with uh, length equal to the number of parameterizer gates, and uh, where each element is compatible with the corresponding end, or a dictionary with keys. And if you are curious, you can have a look at uh, the um, examples. There are some other examples using different parametric gates, like uh, the fsim gate and other mechanism of loading parameters by using dictionaries. You know? For example, in this case, you have this, uh, this expression where you attach to each a moment uh, a parameter. So in our case, we do set parameters and we send here the angles. Now we can double check uh, if this operation was successful by uh, printing, for example, again, the C dot get parameters. And as you can see here, uh, we are getting exactly the same numbers that we have generated in the previous cell. You know, from zero to zero thirty-six, zero seventy-three, until reaching two times pi, you know, two pi, which is six dot twenty-eight, the last number in the list. Uh, the next thing we have to do, given that we are interested in uh, projecting the predictions of our circuit into some observable, is to construct an observable. Uh, there are many choices, but for us, in this case, uh, we can create an observable O, which is the projection of what you see here, um, by making the choice of using minus the summation of Zi as a Hamiltonian. You know? So we take Z the Z Hamiltonian for the observable. So this can be quite simple to implement. We write observable equal to uh, Hamiltonians dot Z, and we select the appropriate number of qubits. So n qubits are equal to n qubits. And then we print the observable. So we do it. OBS dot matrix so we can double check that our definition, our observable definition is consistent. So as you know, the structure of, of the Z operator is the one that is the diagonal one. So in, uh, we should expect to see a diagonal matrix where the first elements are negative. So we have minus three because we have the two qubits until reaching the lower right uh, lower bottom area of the matrix where the sign flips and we have three. Okay, so this is our observable. Now, I mean, is that okay? So we have allocated the Z Hamiltonian. Now we can go ahead, ask the circuit to be executed and then compute observables using this observable, the Z observable. Right, so let's do it. Our final state is equal to the circuit C with n shots equal to, for example, 2000. So this will perform the important sampling that we explained uh, yesterday. We can print the final state. So the exact simulation result. And after that we can do two things. One is to compute the frequencies for, for the shots and store uh, the counter, or in particular, or, or the binary, depending on what we do. In my case here, I will print the, count the um, binary version. And then we can also make a plot with the different amplitudes, the pro the, the in this case, the directly the counters, so the number of hits for each state. No? 
So in this setup here, you do frequencies that are equal to the final state dot frequencies. And I use select the option binary true. Yes, please. Uh, Exactly, exactly. Here you go. So you can do it already, and you can see it. This is in the representation, I mean, the graphical representation of the states using the cat bra operators, which corresponds to the row and column of the matrix. But if you, if you wanted to see the nice uh, matrix, you just uh, do dot state, and you get uh, the NumPy array, which corresponds to the density matrix, the final density matrix. Yeah, so th there is a uh, question from Zoom asking if you're not uh, using the observable. Yeah, not yet. Here we I'm just computing the state, but I you do I you use the observable later by computing the expectation value. Okay, so this is one step. Then the next step is the frequencies. Uh, we can execute and also check the output. Now let me comment on this and just print the frequencies, so you can have a look at uh, how they look like. So here we have the counter object, and the counter object is measuring uh, how many times we get the 0, 1, 1, the 0, 0, 1, and the other state. Now, if instead of using binary, I, I use directly, the f I put false, so I, put I switch off the binary representation, what you should expect to see is, uh, well, again, the number of counters, but based on, um, on, the, on, the, on the qubit, uh, uh, bas based on the index of, this of the counter. So for us, it's better to use the, the true level because then we can directly go to matplotlib and set uh, the x levels matching directly the state composition, so it's easier. Uh. Okay, let's make a plot. So we do plot script dot um, uh, visualize state with frequencies. And here we have our final state. So we have the distribution for all the com combinations of qubits. Right, so at this point, what you should try to, to just to remember for the next is that for a, that specific circuit, the circuit that we have implemented, the expected output corresponds to this histogram. So this is the best that you can do with 2,000 shots. So it's the cleanest, no noisy, I mean, it's the simulation based only on the important sampling from, from the shots, but anything else. Now we are not introducing any other source of uncertainty. The other thing we can do is that we can in plot the density matrix. So if you do plot scripts dot plot density, mm -hmm. no, it doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see if it works. No. no. No problem, we do it. No, 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 I will do it. Ah, okay. Good. Is the, what is C dot uh, state? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Are you cast casting out? Do you remember? Yeah. Pa, pa, pa. State, no? State. Mm -hmm. um, and comma. Yeah, do this. 
this for my synapse uh, PLGN zero mark one. Here we go. So this is the density matrix. Um, yeah, ah, yeah. Let me do slightly better. We can do put, put color bar. And then that's it. I think this is sufficient for us. Yeah, you see. Maybe let me change this because this color marker I don't like too much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I use I use The point is that, wait a sec. Yes, here we go. Yeah, so you were, you see, you, what you can see here, you can see that the di diagonal is closed. There are different numbers. Now you have R zeros or you have a 0 0.6, 0 0.7 and go down. But uh, the most important part is that there are, there is still off, co co I mean, there are lots of uh, off diagonal terms. Now those that are in the boundary here, this uh, square, which is appearing. So is a pure state. The only source of noise comes from the shots. Yes, just uh, before I go to you, there is a question on Zoom asking about uh, the plot density matrix. Yeah, it, it's not in my branch where I'm working, but uh, this will be, I think it's available, right, for them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have the code, we just need to put in this version of the, of the, of the, 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 the keyword, yeah. yeah. So we're doing basically the same you see here. Yeah, this is exactly yeah, the same. Because here you see better the color. Yeah. yeah. No, no, is the angles are the same because we are using the linear spaced function to generate uh, angles from 0 to 2 pi. They are not random. No, no. no. Yeah, in this case, we wanted to have all the, uh, not the last of the same height. It's a, it's a specific set of points. Are uh, like if you divide the, the 0 to pi range into 18 squares. That's why we. Okay, so this is for the simulation of our circuit. Now we can do, um, before applying noise, we can try to compute some of the observable that we have constructed. So this observable uh, can be, evalu you can take the expectation value of the observable, which is defined by the operation you see here. So we do the normalization coefficient, and then we sum up the um, uh, eigenvalues of the observable uh, times the frequencies that we have observed from uh, from the simulation that we did above. So in Kibo, all these oper these operations can be done automatically. It's quite uh, quite simple. So we do um, exponential expectation value equal to the observable dot expectation from samples because we have the samples, we have the old frequencies, and we send the frequencies as the first parameter of our simulation here. And afterwards we can print results. So that's exactly what usually you do when you, I mean, you, you want to compute a number no, from the circuit. And later on you see, for example, I, I believe you can do it. So you see a variation of quantum uh, again over where we do these operations uh, systematically in order to get a number that represents, for example, the energy of the Hamiltonian or uh, other stuff. Do you recall um, the comment that um, Matteo did at some point before? It can be done practically only if the observable is diagonal in, in the basis in which you go to perform the measurements. Uh, if not, you need to post-process applying further operations or change the basis of the, of the measurement, like you were suggesting to detect the noise indeed. Okay. okay.
yeah, yeah, yeah. That's normal. That's normal because yeah, it's normal because you are. We are still introducing some randomness uh, when you do this, when you do the number of shots. So m my random seed is different from yours. You should expect to see a different number. But in principle, if you increase this number, our num our predictions for the observable will converge. So at this stage, we are almost ready to apply noise. Uh, but again, you should be, uh, let's clarify, no? We did so far simulations, exact simulations. So we had our state vector, then we implemented the shots measurement, and this generates some noise, the statistical noise that you can get in the system. So all these features are simulation. We are not introducing any decoherence, anything that will destroy our system from uh, a super operator that is ap applied to the quantum state. Now here is pure simulation. Okay, so it's uh, three. I would suggest you to do the first break now, and then we reconvene at uh, 3.20 with the noise, by adding noise to the system. And please remember to go upstairs if you didn't register as Dario was mentioned before.